Welcome, and thank you for being with us for another special guest episode here at the Institute for Natural Philosophy. Today we have none other than Brian Corey Dobbs, the award-winning documentary filmmaker who wrote, edited, and directed the excellent movie Blue Planet Red. It explores the idea of Mars, not as we see it today, but as a planet filled with life, oceans, and perhaps even intelligent life. He went to great lengths to speak with the major names in the areas of knowledge approached, including several academic researchers of high renown. I could not recommend it more to all those interested in this subject, though it is also an excellent introduction to all those unaware of it. The link to the movie and Brian's websites will be in the description. My name is Ricard Calvario, owner of the History, Myths and Legends channel, and I was lucky to be this episode's host. I can only hope you will enjoy it as much as I did. Brian, thank you very much for being with me this evening and for taking the time for us to have this conversation. Uh, I am thrilled as I can be because Mars is part of my own cosmology and I do have some ideas about how the planet became uh, what it is today, but I'm not going to, it's not about me. I'm, I'm hoping to learn from your experience and what you have learned and digged through, through your exercises, your excellence. I, I, I watched your, your movie that I, I strongly recommend. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's quite insightful and brings what, what data should bring, not answers, but a lot of questions that allow us to go and search and gain a little land piece by piece uh, towards the, the goal of understanding the past of not only of our planet, but even our, of our solar system. So once again, Brian, thank you very much for being with us. You're, you're welcome, Ricardo. Ricardo. Um, if I remember correctly, I think we initially connected on Twitter uh, because weren't you posting about pyramids? And you were posting about something relating to Mars, and 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 I responded to that, and then I think we connected. Exactly. So uh, I'm, you know, I I'm new to the game, so to speak. I I've only been looking at Mars for the for less than two years, and 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 I know that there are a lot of other people who have been studying Mars <clears throat> uh, for a lot longer, and you know when we talk about Mars, there's the Mars as presented by NASA and uh, as presented by academia and then there's everything else <laughs> and the everything else really intrigued me because well it's 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 research and it's analysis done by credible well credentialed experts using data collected by NASA and European Space Agency and what I just find so interesting is that NASA and academia just leave a lot out. They just would rather pretend that a lot of this data doesn't exist, whether it be, you know, atmospheric measurements, whether it be photograph, you know, uh, things that they're seeing in photographs. Uh, you know, with regard to photographs, NASA takes thousands of photographs, rover and orbiter photographs. They are... Uh, legally obligated to publish them, but they don't have to make a big deal about what they find. You know, they they throw up all these photographs, but they don't offer any of their expert analysis unless it's a really, you know, uh, popular feature. You know, <clears throat> for example, obviously there's the face on Mars. NASA is going to have a page about the face on Mars, and they're going to call it a hill. That's fine because there's a lot of public interest related to the face on Mars. Um, but there are hundreds of other weird structures that just defy explanation when you're trying to look for a natural explanation. And when I started looking at this a couple of years ago, I went down a rabbit hole. You know, I'm, I'm a filmmaker. And I said, there's a really interesting story here. And yes, there's videos that have been made that have been posted on YouTube, but I really wanted to try to capture the story here in a more cinematic way. And um, thus began my journey into 
Mars down the Mars rabbit hole. And, uh, you know, meeting other people like yourself who have uh, undoubtedly been aware of some of these anomalies for quite some time now. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, thanks to people like you who are bringing attention to these things, allowing people like me to get caught up on it. You know, you got to have somebody covering these things. You got to have somebody bringing attention to these weird things, talking about it, because NASA isn't going to. So I appreciate your work and, and everyone else's work on this. <clears throat> oh, well, uh, I, I would say that I'm looking at this since I it, it came to me first by Richard Oakland. Mm -hmm. uh, and and from that on, I, I started to try and confirm, get confirmation of what he is presenting. And let's not forget, he presented this to the UN. So it, it's, it was not a small thing. And, and, and I, I'm, what you, you, you pointed, the, the fact that one thing is what NASA told us, tells us, and one thing is what NASA finds, and every other agency that, that have looked at Mars, is I remember we struggled to even make them show a blue sky on Mars. We, we, we had to, to do a lot. In the times of the early internet, we are struggling to try and make them show us why are you changing the color of the sky? It makes no sense because it, it has been shown that you were changing the color of the sky. Okay, you take opportunity when there are dust storms and the sky gets that really, that, that red, but so does, does on Earth. It's exactly the same thing. Yes, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. That's been, that was one of the curiosities early on when I started looking into Mars, where I started seeing people online saying, NASA is artificially coloring these photos from Mars. And at first, I was probably like most people thinking, nah, that's not true. Why would they do that? <clears throat> <laughs> so but then I kept on seeing it, and it wasn't until I, I really you know, heard it from the source, I guess you could say, um, when I started interviewing folks for my film. <clears throat> and by the way, you know, in, in my film, I really wanted to have as much you know, uh, credibility as, as possible. So, uh, you know, fortunately I was able to interview um, Professor Richard Hoover, who was NASA's lead astrobiologist at the Marshall Space Flight Center up until his retirement in 2012. And he's a bright guy, my God. I was able to interview the son of Dr. Gil Levin and Gil Levin worked on the Viking labeled release life detection experiment for the Viking mission in 1976. Uh, and, and many others, and uh, Gillivan's son, uh, Ron, <clears throat> when I was interviewing him, he was, he was commenting on just this, this, this issue here, the coloring of Mars. He was there right when they were getting the images received back from Mars. He was there at the NASA control room when these images were being projected up on the TV screens. And what did they see? They saw more or less a brownish desert and blue sky. The sky, yeah. And in the moment, everyone was shocked. They didn't know what to think because they expected something different. Uh, and I was surprised to learn that, well, he has firsthand knowledge of this because he witnessed it, but he said the technicians in the room went around and artificially adjusted the tint yeah. of each of the monitors in the room so that it would look more like what we expected it to look like red soil with a red sky ron then tells me he goes back and he changes them back <laughs> <laughs> to what they should have been the true colors and he gets in trouble for it so i'm like this is really weird really curious as to what's going on now why do they do this you know one could only speculate here but if we've been sold this vision of mars that it's the red planet <clears throat> you know the, the pictures should match what what's being sold to us so you know some might say well they're why do they do this because they want to project a sense that mars is this inhabitable world and it's this alien world it, it's not hospitable to life it's nothing like earth blah 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 i've heard that you know maybe that's true maybe it's not 
it's just it's really curious as to why NASA would deliberately manipulate their own photographs. And to give them credit, they are coming around to this and uh, doing that less. They are releasing photographs that are more true color. Yes. So 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 that's something of an improvement. But I don't know if they've ever officially given us a response. Do you know if they've ever commented on this? No, I, I haven't. What I've seen is when they were questioned in, in those uh, public speeches, they always claim that uh, there is no manipulation of images when we know they've done it since the time of the moon. And that is what color appears is what the the the... The, the camera is capturing at the time and if there are some blue sky then it is because sometimes the conditions allow a blue sky on mars but there is no highlight to it there is no importance is given to that matter but i would point this you you spoke about the most known thing on mars probably that is the face on mars well I would like to point out that first of all there is not one but perhaps several with two already photographed and the second one is much more feminine much more elaborate it's it's almost like a, a perfect sculpture on on perhaps a rigid stone or one that was affected by less water or the events that destroyed mars but my point is not about that one that is not confirmed it's about the one we know exists is that the photographs that were initially taken by the viking have no relation to the photographs that were later um, published by, by um, I don't remember, the, the Voyager, I think it was, that took uh, the other photos of the face. The fact is, the face was nuked. That's the only explanation, because the difference there is between the symmetry and the, and the quality of the sculpture between the first images and those that we are presented now. And I have done posts comparing both of them. Either it's not the same face or it was destroyed. So some speculated that some device, some nuclear device was sent or some strong bomb directly at that spot to destroy that piece of evidence that there was a previous civilization. Uh, in a time that we some of us were questioning are we earthlings or are we martians that came on on the, because there was no longer possible to live on mars and when i saw your presentation saying that there are two uh, nuclear areas or nuclear reactive areas on mars it immediately connected uh, with, that's why I sent you the invitation to speak because it immediately connected with my uh, perception of what happened there. So, but the water itself, as as you made on on your video, is it's proof enough that it, it was a planet with life in a period when the Earth was completely different than today because the Moon was in a different position if there was there at all. Uh, and if not, the winds were dramatic. The speed of rotation was super fast. So it, life could only develop in a basic level. There is no chance for life to evolve into the, the higher state that we see today. And that was Mars. So what can you say about that from, from what you talk and the experts and the academics and all those people that you talked about for a movie? Yes. Um well, that's just it. This this directly informs the title of the documentary, is that when we look at Mars today, it's this, well, we'll just call it a red planet, you know, uh, <clears throat> meaning it's, it's, it's a desert wasteland, uh, which, which, you know, of course, that's, you know, what, what the photos depict. You look at all these photos, it's just boring, rocky landscape, and there's not much to it. Um, <clears throat> But that's not how it used to be. We know this because of the planet's signature color, red, reddish, you know, we'll say, which is essentially just what we see is rust. Okay. What is rust? Rust is iron oxide. How is it formed? It is formed when oxygen interacts with the presence of water in the atmosphere. <clears throat> so, you needed to have a lot more water on the planet and a lot more oxygen on the planet to create all of the rust that coats the entire surface of the planet. And 
you could only do that if there was a thicker atmosphere. And if there was a thicker atmosphere, then you could have oceans of liquid water <clears throat> and a breathable you know, atmosphere, breathable, uh, habitable atmosphere. If you have a habitable atmosphere and oceans of liquid water, you know, what does NASA always talk about today when they're trying to search for life elsewhere in our solar system or wherever? Follow the water. Where there's water, there's most likely going to be life. So NASA wants to pivot these days and not searching for current life on Mars, but searching for past life on Mars because they feel comfortable talking about this, that there used to be life on Mars because we know it used to be like Earth. <clears throat> and when you take that into account, if you rewind the clock, if, if, if we here on Earth think about Mars differently, not as it is today, dead, essentially, a corpse, but a living, breathing planet, just like Earth used to be. If you have oceans of liquid water, breathable atmosphere, blue sky, what does that sound like? That sounds like Earth. And surely there must have been abundant life there. And I don't think even the most institutionalized professor would disagree with that, or at least the majority of them. I think the majority of them would probably say, yes, well, if it was like Earth, then surely there must have been life. And if the discussion is about what life used to be on the planet in the past, it saves them from talking, it saves them the trouble from having to address the evidence for current life on the planet today. And this documentary of mine was published, it was released in November of last year. So it hasn't even been out for a year yet. And since then, I've been, you know, keeping in touch with uh, everyone I've interviewed, everyone in, in the film. And there's, um, you know, I, I have now, you know, my, my core group of scientific advisors who I can go to to try to suss out what's real and what's not. And, um, you know, uh, Barry DeGregori, who you see very briefly in the film talking about trace fossils, he's been studying Mars for three decades now. He actually wrote a book on Dr. Gil Levin and the labeled released experiment aboard the Viking mission back in the 70s. And so he essentially did the book version of what I did here, uh, you know, 30 years later with, with the documentary, just focused on the, the, the Viking mission. <clears throat> and he has since, since the film has come out in November, he has since uh, relayed to me that there's even more evidence than I knew when I was making the film for current life on Mars. And he, he, he explained this to me, and, and, and I'm blown away because I'm thinking, why, why isn't anyone talking about this? And uh, it's, it, it, it supports what the Viking labeled release experiment. And what is the Viking labeled release experiment? Uh, so let's, let's just rewind the clock back to 1976. NASA, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, sent these Viking missions, two of them. Uh, two orbiters and two landers, and they send these things to Mars, and aboard each one of these landers was these life detection experiments. And what this life detection experiment called the labeled release experiment, how it functioned was it scooped up some dirt, fed it some nutrients, and it measured whether or not it produced any gas. Measured, And, and that essentially tests for respiration active metabolism if, if anything is digesting food and producing gas and so the results came back positive in two different locations thousands of miles away from one another <clears throat> so you think okay well great there we go uh we just proved it um because this experiment this labeled release experiment was run over four thousand times on earth and it never failed it never had a false negative nor a false positive. It always returned the correct result. So NASA, given this perfect track rec record, NASA told Dr. Gillivan, well, we love your experiment. Let's put it on Viking because it runs perfectly. <clears throat> so they send it to Viking. They send it to Mars and it tests positive. But then the question is, why does NASA say, well, the results were inconclusive? And the 
long story short, the, the reason why NASA says the life tests were inconclusive was because there was an additional experiment aboard the Viking mission. It's known as the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. Okay, and this thing tested for organics in the soil. And in 1976, the GCMS test was not sensitive enough to test for organics in the soil. It did not find organic material in the soil. So NASA was left with the conundrum. How do you have living microbes without any organic matter in the soil? So they said, well, the results are inconclusive because we can't explain this. Now, if you fast forward to the Curiosity rover decades later, well, guess what? Curiosity found the organics that they were looking for in 1976. They were there the whole time. So had they found them in 1976, one could argue, well, maybe they wouldn't have said the results, the, the live test results were inconclusive. <clears throat> so there's, there's, there's that going on. There's this culture of, well, there's, this, there's no life on Mars. We didn't, we didn't find anything. And unfortunately, Dr. Gillivan was ridiculed um, in the wake of, of this discovery for the rest of his life. No one really wanted to take his work seriously. And his partner, Patricia Ann Stratt, who helped him adapt this experiment for the Viking mission. Now, what I find so compelling is the additional evidence for life. That's one piece of evidence. There's additional evidence for life on Mars which didn't make it into the film because I just wasn't aware of it. <clears throat> you have, let's go back to the Curiosity rover, where in, you know, uh, let's say 10 years ago or so, it found the organic materials in the soil. And not only did it find organic materials in the soil, it also found something, an organic substance known as dimethyl sulfide, Okay, now if you've never heard of this thing, this organic substance, dimethyl sulfide, all you have to know is this. On Earth, as we know it today, scientists only know one way to produce dimethyl sulfide, and that is through active microbial activity. Microbes are the only thing that can produce it. Living microbes, okay? So question is why aren't they making a big deal about that is that not evidence for life i'm not saying proof but is that not evidence for life okay and a few years ago there was an abstract published by a nasa scientist again we're going back to nasa data here it's their data nasa scientist dr carol stoker through the use of spectroscopy where you shine a light at something and see what wavelengths reflect back through the use of spectro spectroscopy found evidence for chlorophyll on mars what is chlorophyll where do we know chlorophyll from plants okay so why didn't they make a bigger deal about that why didn't they follow up on that and lastly one other bit of photographic evidence something odd called rock varnish and for those of you who have not heard of rock varnish before just imagine a rock out in the desert covered in this black hard coating okay it's not a slime it's really hard and crusty but what happens is microbes long story short microbes produce this black shiny coating on rocks out in the desert you know i think they're eating mang manganese something to do with manganese and microbe activity and really the only way we know rock varnish can be produced is through active microbial activity. So we have photographic evidence of this, and NASA knows this. They're, they're actually folks at Los Alamos uh, nuclear labs who are studying this rock varnish, and they're publishing papers on this rock varnish. They say this could be active evidence for active microbial activity. However, because they are on this fault under this pretense that mars has no life they're trying to figure out a way that this is produced abiotically just chemically without without microbes so when people say there's no evidence for life on mars currently today to that i'd say they are wrong it's just flat out wrong there is evidence and i believe we should follow up on that sure how about the, that's the thousands of images that so possible uh, lakes possible trees or some sort of bush that is completely different from, from what we see to today 
uh, that they have coordinates, they have the number from the NASA that when they're taken, the only thing that blames them and, 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 and blemish them, I mean, is the fact that we, we cannot, lo we can no longer found them in NASA archives. So those images were all removed. They were online, but then they were all removed. The problem now is that from those thousands of images, we need but one to be true. So when people say, oh, they are false, they are just amounted, okay, but from thousands of images, there is not one that is real, right? Because if if they if they were changed, no one dreamed with this. Someone found the real one and then started to make another one to create the fake history. But the fact is, from thousands, we don't need only one to be true. And I'm sure that I have plenty that are more than confirmed. In fact, there are some that are not that clear representing life, but they are still but they are enough to create a doubt and they are still on NASA archives uh, that are accessible. So that's why I think some of them at least are real and that's more than enough. Moreover, if you send, this was a, an argument used in the 80s, in the 90s, if you send a probe ship exactly as those that we send to Mars into some places of Earth, it will return with the same results, meaning no life, there's only dust and rocks. There's plenty of areas where you can send a probe into Earth and find nothing at all. But then again, we, going back to the microbes that you were speaking, that dilemma ended when extremophiles were proven because scientists were still believing that life was only possible in that optimal conditions where they could thrive according to their own needs and and when they start finding animals living in temperatures above 100 degrees uh, uh centigrade by the way uh when they found uh organism living near or inside the volcanoes itself or in in uh, sulfur lakes and places where shouldn't be life places without any sort of light uh, light sorry and even then, I would add that people don't know this, but I keep referring to this. There is the, the space station. They need to come out regularly to take bacteria and microbial life from the windows. Otherwise, they will cease to look outside. The window will get completely fogged by these creatures. So life exists even in the vacuum of space. They yeah, lots, lots to respond to there. Uh, I guess as it res as it relates to microbial life versus intelligent life, as we know here on Earth, with exceptions, with a few exceptions, microbial life is essentially everywhere. We find it in the most extreme environments, high pressure, high temperature environments, even low temperature environments. Um, NASA astrobiologist, Dr. Uh, Professor Richard Hoover, explain to me how <clears throat> there are certain microbes that can live directly in ice and they can melt the ice around them using a natural antifreeze to then get the nutrients that are stored in the ice so 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 if there's ice on mars he says there's he says there's a hundred percent chance there's going to be microbes there because <clears throat> microbes as you said can even survive on the outside window the International Space Station, you know, they're there, they're, they're, they're surviving. They can, they can withstand some extreme environments. I even heard that some microbes can live within nuclear fuel waste. Hmm. So, so they can survive everywhere. The question then becomes, okay, well, can life thrive to the point at which it develops into macroscopic <clears throat> or even intelligent life? And we try to answer this question in the film because we see things there in these photographs that just defy a natural explanation. You know, we do see artifacts. Uh, well, I shouldn't say artifacts. We just, what, how I should say, what, what I do frame them as, we see these funny looking rocks. <laughs> <laughs> what is this strange shape that this rover took a picture of? Is that a rock? 
you know, what does it look like to you, the viewer, when you're watching this? We just want to show you the picture. We're not trying to characterize it, but what does it intuitively look like to the person watching it? Because when you when you see something strange, what is that? You know, you want to go up to it, take a closer look at it. We're curious beings. Why isn't it done? Yeah. And we're, here we have the Curiosity Rover not living up to its name. <laughs> You know, it should be curious to go find out more. <clears throat> so then you take that one step further and take a look at orbiter photographs. Well, okay, let's go back to the face for just a moment. And you could argue whether or not it's supposed to be a face all day long. But take the face out of the equation for a moment. The surrounding perimeter of this feature is symmetrical and <clears throat> it is defined by repeated expressions of geometry if you layer on and in the film we show this it's 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 hard to show this now because we're just talking about it but it is it is defined by repeated expressions of three four five right triangles and this is really fascinating to me um now there are other things beyond just the face there are these things that appear to be unexcavated pyramids. <clears throat> now, what does this mean? Well, if you take a look at Teotihuacan, uh, which is a pyramid here on Earth, 100 years ago, it was under a lot of dirt. And it just looked like a big hill with trees on it. <clears throat> if you remove all that dirt, well, guess what? There's a pyramid underneath. Same thing with Chichen Itza pyramid. 100 years ago, there's a lot of dirt on top of it. It just looked like a big hill. If you remove all that dirt, well, guess what? There's a pyramid underneath. And if you look at orbiter photographs of what they've taken on Mars, you see these structures that, you know what? They just don't look like a volcano like we would know. Like Olympus Mons, okay? It's, it's most commonly referred to as being the largest volcano. And there are other volcanoes in that Tharsis region, okay? They're circular. <clears throat> Okay, that's what you know to be a volcano. It is circular in shape. So when you have something that is square or triangular, or in the case of this other funny looking hill near the face, which is five sided and can be bisected and has symmetry on both sides and has repeated expressions of 30, 60, and 90 internal angles, what in nature creates something like that? And I have yet to hear a satisfactory answer. So I'm sitting around here looking at all this evidence for something more than just natural geology, and I'm wondering, why isn't anybody making a big deal about this? Now, to your point, Richard Hoagland and uh, other people, 30 years ago, tried to, and they got pretty far, and we owe them a lot of credit. We do owe Richard Hoagland a lot of credit. He is, uh, <clears throat> he is laughed at these days by, by serious, or rather by, he's, he's, he's a serious guy, but he, unfortunately, um, I think some believe he took it a little too far, and there's a lot of baggage now when you talk about this idea about life on Mars. But I do want to give him credit because he did get us asking these questions. And the about... architecture part of it is sound. Well, he did dwell into other aspects that are more metaphysical than 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 physical. Yes. But the architecture part, I think it's still valid today. Oh, it, it absolutely is. And that's why I want to give him full credit for, for, for getting us looking at these things and taking them seriously because he put together... You know, here, here's just a science writer, Richard Hoagland. He's a, he's a journalist, okay, with a natural curiosity just like you and me. And he took it upon himself to independently put together a team to analyze these strange hills on Mars. And he pulled in a few people who I was able, fortunately enough, to actually get for the film. Dr. Mark Carlotto, an aerospace industry engineer who's who specializes in uh satellite photography uh plasma physicist dr john brandenburg um 
<clears throat> anthropologist Dr. Randy Pozos and, and some others to, to take a serious look at these photos because NASA isn't doing that. They're not taking this stuff seriously. So we do have to give him credit. But when I'm sitting here looking at these images for myself and I leave it to the viewer to come to their own conclusion, what do these look like? If you side by side compare them to things that we have here on Earth, from space looking right down on some of these pyramidal shapes, they look like pyramids. And that is such a strange thing to say. Pyramids on Mars. Because we just thought of Mars as just this giant, boring desert wasteland, nothing there but rocks. But if you think about the concept of what pyramids on Mars might mean, then you have to ask the next question. Where did these pyramids come from? <clears throat> Someone must have put them there. <laughs> yeah. You know, so therefore, wow. That's, and next that's to the pyramids, compelling. you have rectangular shaped areas that look like what an Inca city looks like from the sky and some people have made comparative photos so there is that possibility because we have not only a single pyramid there the DNM pyramid as it's called we don't have only that we have that one two or three more all in geometrical alignment and inside it we have that maze of rectangular walls well I, I think it's important for anyone listening to understand that we do have this under we do have this narrative that we've been told by nasa we trust nasa because they're they're you know they've done many great things okay they've sent people to space they sent people to the moon and we've learned a lot from their instruments <clears throat> we've sent probes the voyager probes out past our solar system you know so they've done incredible feats of engineering and in the 70s in the 60s and 70s 70s they did prioritize this question of life is there extraterrestrial life on our neighboring planets but since then in the wake of the viking labeled release experiment ambiguous fiasco they've sort of put the life question on hold <clears throat> because it opens up a can of worms okay it's it's it, it introduces it, uh, the, the potential for too many questions that they don't feel like answering. This is just what I think, okay? And instead, they've pivoted to, let's just study the geology because no one's going to ask us questions about geology or rather, no one's going to ask us questions about life if all we're talking about is the geology of the planet, okay? The chemical composition of the rocks, what these rocks do, evidence of past river flows you know where that we can see in the sediment absolutely, and things like that absolutely and my question is does nasa have any archaeologists on staff do they have any paleontologists on staff looking at these things i don't know uh, because if they do i'm not hearing from them and i did try i did I, well i did get Professor Richard Hoover, who did work at NASA as their lead astrobiologist to, to appear in the film, I, I tried to get NASA <clears throat> representatives who are currently employed involved with the film and was not able to get permission to do so. They just didn't feel like making a comment on these things. So I tried to. But given my own personal experience, and I'm sure this is shared by many, is that when we start learning more about the history of our planet, the history of our solar system, oftentimes we are confronted with knowledge, with information that runs counter to what we've been told. It is not the same as what we've been told. And what do we do with that? Because we put our trust in something, and yet here some new information comes that doesn't sync up. And it requires, it challenges us to think of our history a lot differently we need a little we need permission to think of our history in a different way given new information that comes in and that was part of the goal for this film is that look if you the viewer thought there was something else going on with mars well this is the film for you okay because i'm here to say that i think there is too 
And I went and interviewed as many people as I could tackling this question about life on Mars, what the planet used to be like, what the planet is today, and what happened to try to analyze it from many different perspectives as possible and to try to paint this comprehensive picture about what's really going on with Mars. So if you can accept that something else might be going on there, well, I've got the story for you, which is based on data collected by NASA and the European Space Agency. I don't know how much more official you can get. You can get. <laughs> 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 yeah, but look, even the fact that it is academically speaking well known that there are boundaries and a known past ocean on Mars, it appears on maps. We must assume that some sort of draw effect. I'm not sure if you are aware of, of the term draw effect in scientific terms. Okay, so this is an important fact in science. Science has something called the draw effect and what is it the draw effect is the allowance given to scientists to only publish the parts of their research that they are interested on or the ones that gave the results that they wish to show or they believe would happen so anything that comes against even taken by them in their experiments everything that goes against their own narrative they are um they are given the possibility to put it on the draw. That's why in science it's called the draw effect. So this is why science today is on the state that it is, because we cannot trust it to the point of saying that this was all the data that I got. It isn't. Yes, thank you for uh, bringing this up. What I was very surprised to learn when I started producing this, this documentary, I was already filming it, and then I learned about the work of the Thunderbolts project. And Thunderbolts has done a lot of work regarding this electrical universe theory. <clears throat> Excuse me. And specifically as it relates to Mars, they, th they propose that a lot of the geological features that we see on Mars today, the scarring, there's this giant scar, the Vallis Marineris scar, and other features on Mars were actually produced by electrical discharge, okay? And, well, what does this mean? When you have, what is electrical discharge? For those of you who don't know, electrical discharge is very simply, <laughs> you know, one could refer to it as a lightning bolt when the electrical potential, and there's a different charge between the ground and the atmosphere, okay? And then they neutralize each other by, by this electric uh, event, a uh, lightning bolt. Or when you shock your fingers on a door handle, okay? That's a little discharge. And so we have a little tiny discharge and we have a big discharge. Electrical discharges can even be bigger. They are scalable. They can be up to the planetary size. So what would cause a planetary-sized electrical discharge? Well, if you have, say, for example, two planets within close proximity to one another, one is, let's just say, a positive charge and one is a negative charge, just being simplistic here. Well, they're going to, they're going to electrically discharge between the two of them. And this giant planet-sized lightning bolt will disrupt the surface of each planet. <clears throat> okay? Uh, so that's one idea. And, well, what's, what, uh, well, how would this happen, you know, to your point about the asteroid belt? Well, it is proposed, and I'm not qualified to speak on this, I'm just speaking on behalf of what has been proposed by others who study this, is that our current solar system is in a much different configuration than how it used to be. There could have been an, an uns, a more unstable version of our solar system where the planets weren't exactly where they are today. Planets moving from one place to another, past one another. And we know this, or rather we suspect this, because of what was recorded in these ancient texts where what we call myths 
people here on earth witness something in the sky that we don't see today. And these people from all over the earth, this is the work of specifically uh, a man who, who appeared in the film, uh, Ev Cochran, okay? And he has studied, he's a comparative mythologist, and he has studied, um, you know, the these myths from all over the world, and he finds the similarities between them, okay? So when you have cultures from all over the world recording down their stories, <clears throat> things that they witnessed or things that they saw, observed, and they're, and he's finding similarities between them all, and these people had no contact with one another, and they're scattered all throughout their all throughout earth and they're seeing something in the sky while well, we're trying to figure out what they saw and astronomy is one of these sciences that you cannot reproduce in the lab you can only observe and so astronomers today have to rely on uh, on the accounts of those that came before them unfortunately they are discounting they're dismissing some of them when analyzing what happened in the historical record they are not taking into effect certain petroglyphs certain hieroglyphs whatever when trying to figure out what what was going on many thousands of years ago in fact they changed the meaning to incorporate it on their own narrative <laughs> of those petroglyphs and so on right right so so you know here we're just taking a different look at these petroglyphs and, and, and things of that nature and we're, we're trying to interpret them not as myths, but as recorded accounts of what people, eyewitness testimony, essentially, of what was seen many thousands of years ago. Um, now, how does this relate to Mars? Well, you know, certainly the Thunderbolts group and, and Ev Cochran uh, suggest that there, was a, there, were, there were planetary discharges because the, the planets as we see them today are far apart from one another. But in the past, there's evidence to suggest that they were actually much closer to one another so if if you uh if you take if you accept that then you could then you can understand this this process of electrical discharge between two planetary bodies i did interview dr sorry professor robert shock the geologist from boston university who is most well known recently for redating the sphinx in egypt <clears throat> he seems to think that it's not the product of planetary electrical discharge, but the product of a solar outburst, a plasma discharge that would produce these strange scars on Mars. And you know, he has he's done he's he's a well-credentialed uh, expert who's part of academia who's sticking his neck out on these ideas that aren't yet accepted by the rest of the mainstream community, the scientific community. Um, but, you know, he has data to back that up. And so we have him in the film, too, talking about, well, what could have possibly contributed to this massive scarring on the surface of, of Mars? And the question then becomes, well, did this contribute to the loss of the planet's atmosphere? Why is Mars no longer Earth-like? So we examine that question as well, and we suspect that plasma or electrical discharge is one of the leading ideas about how the planet lost its atmosphere <clears throat> and, and how that does relate with the two radioactive areas i mean if you if you think of the, the two most well-known radioactive spots here on earth today are arguably in recent times the the bombing sites in japan in world war ii Okay, Hiroshima, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nagasaki. Okay, <clears throat> we had an airburst of an atomic weapon. Okay, and it made all the land underneath essentially radioactive for a time. Okay, then you have Chernobyl, the nuclear facility meltdown. Okay, it made that whole area radioactive. You can't go in there without a suit, you know, and a Geiger counter. All right, maybe Fukushima. Okay, so while there there are these actually three spots on mars um two are very large one not as much it's similar to what i just described most more similar to to japan hiroshima and nagasaki where there's no where there are no craters but the ground itself is radioactive now it is weak 
meaning it wouldn't it wouldn't be too harmful today if you were there <clears throat> because the evidence suggests that there was a nuclear event in these locations on Mars many hundreds of millions of years ago. Well, uh, you know, this this is the work of, of plasma physicist Dr. John Brandenburg. I mean, this, this is not something that NASA talks about. Um, Dr. John Brandenburg is, is a plasma physicist, and, you know, he's, he has his own career in plasma physics. <clears throat> but he's also just, he was part of this original team by Richard Hoagland, this uh, independent Mars investigative team uh, in the early 80s, taking a look at these structures and, and, and everything else. And one day he's standing in line at work at the copy machine because he wants to copy a, a page out of a book that was talking about the Martian atmospheric isotopes, isotopic measurements that the Viking landers took. And he just wanted to, to copy this page. And standing in front of him was another scientist. He had no idea who this guy was. <clears throat> and he's working in a classified area. So the scientist just turns around and asks him, "Hey, what you what you in line for? What are you what are you, what are you going to copy?" He's like, "Well, I find these Martian atmospheric isotopes quite strange." And the guy looks at the page, and then he has this look of shock on his face, and he looks up at Brandenburg, and he's like, "Oh my God, they've been nuked!" <laughs> and Brandenburg was like, what is this guy talking about? And then that guy got out of line and then left, and he never saw him again because he just was was shocked about this. So then Brandenburg, from that point forward, and I think this was early 80s, from that point forward, dedicated the rest of his career to figuring out what the heck this guy was talking about. about yeah. And I have to say, he's really put in his homework. He's really done a great job investigating this. He's connected these dots. And what are these dots? Well, these dots are, well, in three very prominent locations, there is this radioactive surface, okay, these radioactive hotspots on the surface of Mars. In these locations and elsewhere, there's also a, a glass that is formed that is similar to trinitite. After the, the Trinity test explosion that Oppenheimer did, we all know this from the, the well-done Christopher Nolan film, uh, that came out last year, but after a weapon like that goes off, it it superheats the soil and sand underneath and produces a type of natural glass. Yeah, vitrification of the surface, yes. Yes. Um, and it, getting back to the atmospheric isotopes, in the atmosphere of Mars, we there's an anomaly. And that anomaly is... <laughs> this interesting lesser known gas called xenon and one of the xenon isotopes xenon 129 now what the heck is xenon 129 well xenon is a gas that sometimes is used in flash bulbs okay um but the isotopes of xenon on mars are 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 out of sync with the rest of the solar system we do see xenon 129 elsewhere in the solar system, but we see an elevated level of Xenon-129 on Mars. Now, why is this? How could there be an elevated level of Xenon-129 on Mars? Because the only way you can produce Xenon-129, well, there's, there's only two ways to do it, okay? And one is an exploding star, a supernova. So um, the question is, well, did a supernova place a lot of xenon 129 on mars and we know the answer to this is no because if it had it would have also placed a lot of xenon 129 elsewhere in our solar system we would see it on earth we would see it on jupiter the solar wind the moon and the sun itself but if if rocker robert schrock is correct could we say that an and unfortunately uh, strike from from the sun with a uh, SME, not a CME, but an SME that is a surface mass ejection. It's exactly the portion of the sun that is projected. Uh -huh. If it hit it Mars, it would cause not only the electric phenomenon, it would cause perhaps the increase on that gas, and that would give some validation to what Robert Schrock was saying, perhaps. 
the, instead the, of the, instead, sorry, instead of, of a, a micron, uh, sorry, instead of a, a supernova, it could have been something more like a micronova. And, and sorry to interrupt you. Oh well, you see that that's a good question. This is where we need to get Professor Robert Schock talking with Professor or, or Dr. John Brandenburg. These two have to talk to one another ab about this um, because we, as we present in the film, we present two different methods. Well, NASA tells us that the why Mars lost its atmosphere was because the solar wind has been stripping away the atmosphere of Mars due to its low magnetic field. Due to the, it, it's, it does not have a strong magnetic field. Um, unfortunately, as uh, as presented by Dr. Brett Brandenburg, well, the data suggests that the solar wind alone cannot fully account for the the mass loss of the Martian atmosphere. Something else did it. And as we present in the film, we present two different uh, ideas, which is the electrical or plasma discharge. And you know, this is what I asked Professor Robert Shaw: could could a uh, a, a um, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a solar outburst uh, could could that have contributed to the loss of the atmosphere? He's like, yes. He immediately answered me, yes, it could have. So we do include that. You know, I can't be a hundred percent certain, but I do find his evidence. And his take on it to be quite credible. <clears throat> so, just just to wrap it up on on Dr. Brandenburg's research, if a supernova, see this is that does a good question. I don't uh, SME. I'll have to see what physics happen in an SME because uh, <clears throat> if if it really does require a star exploding, or the only other way that we know xenon 129 can be produced, as I understand it, is by a, a thermonuclear weapon detonation then if you rule out the possibility that it was a supernova then you have to consider the alternative which is it was a bomb and a very big one at that so we do present these two ideas believe me i know they sound dramatic <laughs> when i read this work it kept me up for nights <laughs> This, this is really this is Star Wars right here. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. And, and, <laughs> and, and perhaps after we finish this, I, I will tell you a brief five minutes version of what I believe actually happened. But um, the fact is, the I see all these people doing research on the same subject from different areas, but they seldom meet and discuss. All these points, so it's very hard to reach an uh, educated answer that encompasses all these different disciplines that some people are experts and others are not. Well, I, I agree. Actually, that's a very good point because I I personally think that there is evidence for both electrical or plasma discharge scarring on Mars, but I do I do see. Uh, what what Dr. Brandenburg presents as being very credible, and so far, you know, if if there's someone who can refute him, you know, that hasn't happened yet. No one has been able to refute his findings. Um, you know, there's not all nuclear reactions are the same. This is the important thing to understand: is that you have nucle nuclear reactions that are considered to be uh, what is known as R process, which stands for rapid, rapid process which is rapid neutron absorption okay this is the physics that happens inside a nuclear weapon okay which is distinctly different from the physics that happens inside a nuclear fuel a nuclear um, you know energy facility okay which is s process slow neutron absorption they're two different physics and what brandenburg suggests or rather what he finds is that the only thing that can produce Xenon 129 is our process. So now, but I but there is evidence of, of I'm not I'm not saying that we take Brandenburg only and we we discount all the electrical or plasma stuff because there's there's scarring all over the planet that that the Thunderbolts group, to their credit, has done an amazing job of 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 demonstrating and, and presenting and their series of videos on YouTube. It's an incredible thing. Um absolutely. But interestingly enough, Brandenburg, Dr. Brandenburg, even he he clued me in on something which was which was speaking to your point about let's let's see if, how we can merge these two. Uh, believe it or not, 
and there's video of this, certain nuclear weapons tests in the mid 20th century created lightning. There is a phenomenon known as nuclear lightning. And if you go on YouTube today, you can just type in nuclear lightning and you will see an atmospheric nuclear weapons test that actually produced lightning. So you could have both at the same exact time from the same phenomenon. My, my point is this. There is clearly something going on with Mars more than we've been led to believe. And I can't put all my eggs in one basket, but you know, I, I'm sitting here trying to look for someone who has an alternative alternative explanation for the for the for the analysis and for the data that Dr. Brandenburg, Robert Schock, and the Thunderbolts group has presented. Because thus far it just seems to be ignored and laughed at, which I think is unfortunate because I think it's really good work. That's why I was willing to make this film, put my name on it, put my face in it, and uh, you know, go to bat for, for, for those who are in the film because I really think that they have done a magnificent job of studying this planet that clearly has a lot more going on with it than we've been led to believe. And I don't think it's been given a fair shake. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think all of them deserve credit the only problem to me is when we start picking one as the only explanation. That's why I think it's so important, your movie, and why sh people should see it and interest in, into, into this matter. So uh, I don't know if you want to promote anything uh, coming with uh, any new event. Uh, yes, thank you. Actually, before I do that, let me quickly comment on Olympus Mons. Um, the Thunderbolts sure. group has an amazing hour and a half long documentary about Mars, about it, it interweaves the comparative mythology, all that stuff that was witnessed by our ancient uh, people here on Earth in the skies. And they talk of witnessing catastrophic events in the sky relating to Mars. That's how it sort of begins. And then it shifts more to the science and how they're able to reproduce in a laboratory a lot of these electrical scarring features. And they have a different explanation for Olympus Mons. They say, well, Olympus Mons, this is something I'm willing to entertain because they make a compelling case for it. Yes. They say Olympus Mons itself is the product of electrical discharge and not necessarily a volcano. It doesn't really look like a volcano. And it's got some unusual features. And they, specifically speaking, the outer perimeter of the volcano is not a gradual slope down to the surface. There's this escarpment, yes. okay? And so far, that has not been explained by natural geology. So, uh, the ocean they make, was there? <clears throat> I, I, well, you know, it's, it's not something... I, I don't know. I don't know. But what they compare it to is essentially uh, an a large electrical blister. Okay, and these things can be reproduced in the lab. So if electrical events can be scalable, uh, it actually resembles something more akin to an electrical blister, a very large electrical blister rather than a natural volcanic geological feature. Um, and they say also the, the, the center of it, the, um, the, the crater in the, in the center of it, it actually has overlapping craters and this is another electrical phenomenon where uh, you have these craters on crater edges. And it's only something that is uh, it's not only something, but it is it is primarily something that is reproduced by electrical static uh, discharge. So yeah, the ramification of the electric current. Yes, it's it, it, it's quite compelling. So Olympus Mons itself, you know, I'm not going to bat for that. It's just one of those things that I'm willing to entertain at, at this point. Because if you look at Mount Ikea, that it's larger than than the Everest. It's it's the largest mountain on Earth. If you look at Mount Ikea, it has that same base that then goes down because the, that's where the sea covers it. But our planet could also have been subject to electro discharge. As oh, yes. And, and they have done quite a great job providing analysis for just how the Earth has been... Uh, scarred by electrical or, or plasma discharge and as we present in the film 
um, the case is made that the Grand Canyon itself is the product of electro electrical discharge. So there's there's a whole. I, I tried to relate this as much as possible, uh, you know, to, to to Earth because Mars, the, the the title of the film, Blue Planet Red. You know, when we hear the term Blue Planet, we think of Earth. There's that nice BBC series, Blue Planet. We all love it. It's great. Uh, you just add the the red to it, and suddenly it takes on a different meaning. What happened if we have an Earth? What what would what would Earth look like if it lost its atmosphere and if it lost its oceans? It would look like Mars. Okay, and so what evidence if someone came, you know, a uh, hundred million years after Earth died, let's say, and and found our Egyptian pyramids covered in sand? Would would they say, oh, that's just a hill, or would they say that's an unexcavated pyramid? You know, so it. it while it while these things on Mars don't look pristine, you have to account for the fact that it's it's been eroded over millions of years, perhaps even hundreds of millions of years, um, and and sand and and soil deposits on top of them. So of course it's not going to look pristine. What would what would the Sphinx look like in another million years? What would Mount Rushmore look like in a million years? You know, let's that that's such a that's such a cheap shot. I think that's such an easy out. <clears throat> anyway, there's a lot we present in the film. Uh, you know, I, I thank you for, for, for watching it, Ricardo, and, and, and reaching out. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm glad we connected because I really appreciate, I, I see the work that you're doing online. And I think you've done a magnificent job. You know, I'm thank still you. familiarizing myself with, with your work. Um, but, you know, I definitely want to keep in touch. And I, I think it's people, you know, like you who've been carrying the torch for, for some of these subjects that, that really help the rest of us understand that there's more going on than just what you might receive from one source Absolutely. so so thank you if you want to take a look at the film um <clears throat> two hours long it's got about two dozen people in there from academia aerospace industry independent researchers and and you know richard hoover from nasa <coughs> um you can go to blue planet red dot net and the, the the site there you can watch uh the film through that site there's also you know we have a blog there there's supporting biographies there um the film is on vimeo you can order a blu-ray or dvd copy if you'd like um more about me you can find me on 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 twitter or x at brian Corey dobbs and uh, i'm also on linkedin and youtube at brian Corey dobbs and I also have a personal website, briandobbs.com, which you can find all the rest of my work. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you for being and, and willingly accepted to do this this talk. And I very much appreciate it. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. My pleasure.